Did you know that almost three quarters of medical students incur a median of $200,000 of loan debt at the time of graduation from medical school? And that doesn't even include loans from undergraduate years. And that's before interest starts compounding, which raises the actual total amount paid back to two to three and even four times the principal over the life of the loans. Physicians with such debt often feel underwater throughout their professional lives. It's as though they have a second mortgage. However, there is help. There are options and there are people to assist us with navigating through the complexity of the loan repayment options. So, my guests today are Joy Sorensen Navarre, who is a national recognized educator and expert on student loan debt. She's also the president of the consulting firm, literally called Navigate, which assists physicians in achieving student loan relief. She was one of the first guests in our main podcast, RX for Success, and you'll have to scroll back to episode number nine to hear her, but it is well worth your time. My second guest is Dr. Desmond Bell, who is a podiatrist and the chief medical officer of Omeza, a medical technology and consumer healthcare products company that's focused on healing chronic wounds. He's also the founder and president of the Save a Leg, Save a Life Foundation, which is a nonprofit dedicated to the reduction of lower extremity amputations. Des is also one of my physician coach partners here at MD Coaches and just one heck of a guy. He too was a guest on RX for Success and you can hear his path into medicine story by going to episode number 19. Well, in this episode, you'll hear about misconceptions and common mistakes made by the indebted, the options that are available to deal with loan debt, including repayment plans, account adjustments, consolidation, and even loan forgiveness, and finally, a typical story illustrating the trapped and vulnerable feeling that healthcare professionals often experience in this space and the happy ending that was enjoyed as a result of consulting with Ms. Navarre and a lot, lot more. Please stay tuned. There are times in our lives that change the way we see the world. Navigating these challenges can take insight, trusted confidants, or even a coach. Let's explore those moments. In this companion podcast to RX for Success, we will discover ways to learn and write our own success stories together. I'm Dr. Dale Waxman, a physician coach with MD Coaches, and this is Life Changing Moments. So, Joy Sorensen Navarre and Des Bell, welcome to Life Changing Moments. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, Thanks in a way, me, sure. And in a way, this is welcome back to uh, Joy, uh, who was one of our early RX for Success uh, podcast guests. And uh, you'll hear about the uh, the number to look for for that episode in the program notes. And Des is one of the coaching staff for MD Coaches and also the host of a previous show that we had, which was inside the doctor's lounge. And um, so for those of you who are Des Bell fans, it's it's good to welcome him back to the show. So this show is about financial health. And as we have talked about on the show before, that we're interested in physician well-being in a lot of different perspectives. And one thing we have not attended to too well on this show is financial health. And we're not talking about wealth um, development as much as we're talking about just financial health. And Des has a very compelling story about that. And we're going to get to that in just a bit because he worked with Joy around his financial health. And we'll hear the details of that shortly. But before we get into that, Joy, just a little bit about what you do. And then I have some specific questions about specifically physician debt. Absolutely. I'm the founder of Navigate Student Loans. We work with physicians across the country to help them figure out the best way to repay their student loans. So you've been doing this for a little while. And so I know you're up on the data about this. What percentage of physicians take on debt? 
statistically, it's 73% according to the latest uh, data from the AAMC. So that's quite a bit. That's the majority of most uh, medical school classes. And also, I know there's a lot of, I hear this batted around a lot. What is the average amount of debt that people leave with when they leave medical school? I think that number is surprising, Dale. The statistics show one number, but with the high interest rates that accompany these federal student loans, balances grow pretty quickly. So by the time we're working with a doctor, either in residency or a new attending, when we open up their document before we consult with them, I'm expecting to see $250,000 to $450,000. Neither one of wow. those is an outlier. Those are just the common situation that a medical, that a physician will see. And that's not uncommon to see 500, 600. The most we've ever seen was 873, I think it was. Wow. Well, you know, what, what that brings to mind, Joy, you said already, you know, like by the time they come to you because some of the accumulated mm -hmm. debt, um, I think what I've heard is lower than that, but that's like the amount at medical school graduation, right? So exactly. and we're going to get into why those amounts are different here in just a little bit. But what I've heard is generally speaking, it's about the average at medical school graduation is about 250,000. Does that sound about right to you? It does, yes. Okay, very good. So if that is the average amount, what are some of the misconceptions that physicians have about their debt? What are the common things that you see? You know, we see a number of things. Um, and things have changed over the last few years. It used to be that physicians were surprised at how much their loans had increased during their training. Um, now there's a lot better education during medical school, during residency. And so most commonly physicians today feel like, you know, this is just a burden that I must bear. It's something I'm going to have to figure out. And that's probably healthier, right, than uh, the prior situation. I think we see mistakes when, you know, common mistakes related to stress, related to, oh, I don't have a minute to think about this. I'm just going to do my best. And then they don't think about it for a long time, perhaps, like the set it and forget it. In some cases is a great financial strategy. In other cases, like student loans, where especially in the last, well, the last month, to three years, we've seen a lot of policy changes there's a lot to be paying attention to. So maybe that's the biggest problem is not having the time to pay attention to what's happening. So if those are some of the misconceptions, um, what are some mistakes that are made? Probably the craziest mistake that I've seen is the physician who we had not worked with, but her roommate had worked with us and she had done the exact same thing as her roommate had done. But because every loan situation is different, her outcome was different than her roommates. And so she called us later to say, well, I did everything the same as you had told my roommate to do, and it came out differently. So that's the mistake we see is that people don't realize that um, their situation may be different from someone else's and that really tailored strategy, tailored advice is really the best for physicians with these very large student loans. Yeah. The other thing, if I could tell you, Dale, is that a physician can do everything right. We'll hear a story about that in a minute. And um, the loan servicing company can make mistakes or the system can be set up to negatively impact the physician. And so we see much more of that than we do of physicians making mistakes. It's mistakes that are happening to their accounts, often without their knowledge, um, that are causing problems. Yeah, it feels like, you know, there's a little bit of this, from a physician's perspective, there's sort of like this black box, and we don't know what goes on in that black box. And it's kind of too complex to pay attention to, unless you're pretty interested in that, I would think. And and also, like you just in, indicated, some things change in the administration of these. And how do we, you know, how do you stay up on all that? You know, I guess where we're heading is, so what can be done about this? Because there's a lot of people that are in a lot of debt, and it's really, it's an albatross um, around their neck, and some things kind of get out of control before people realize it. And 
which leads me to to Des and your story. Um, so first of all, tell our listeners just for those who aren't already familiar with you a little bit about who you are, what you di- what you did, and what you now do. Thanks, thanks for having me, Dale. Um, enjoy. It's a pleasure to be with you too, and I can't wait to tell this this story uh, that actually did have a, a, a happy outcome. But you know, just to so everybody knows, I'm Dr. Desmond Bell. Uh, I was in clinical practice for over 25 years in Jacksonville, Florida. I specialize in wound care. I'm a podiatrist by profession, by um, by license. But I, I dedicated my my career to limb preservation and working primarily with people with non-healing wounds. That has led me to another career now, um, serving as the chief medical officer of a company that I helped. Um, I was instrumental in in developing products that turned into a company, and that company is called Omeza. So I wear several hats, and you know, besides MD coaches too, which is where I met Joy. And so, yeah, that's how, kind of how the story kind of comes together, how it all ties ties together. You know, I began my career later than most. Uh, I had actually graduated college, undergraduate, and, and worked for five years and decided I wanted to go back to school and become a physician. And one thing led to another. I was actually fast-tracking to go to Rutgers, believe it or not. Uh, I was looking at orthopedics. And, and then the week before my uh, letter of recommendation was due, my pre-med advisor went out with a quadruple bypass. So now I'm a little bit older and I started getting information from podiatry schools. And I said, well, this makes a lot of sense. So long story short, I enrolled podiatry school in Philadelphia and uh, didn't know much about the whole loan process or anything like that. And now I'm an older student too. At this point, I'm about 30, 31 years old when I'm starting podiatry school. And I wasn't going to ask my parents for money. I mean, they were kind enough to let me move back home for a while while I was doing my pre-medical work. So I took out loans and I figured, well, this is what you got to do. And I'm going to focus now all my energy on being a student and didn't realize what accruing interest meant from the time you signed off on, on a loan. So I took out several loans. And when I tell you, I was not living an exorbitant lifestyle. I was rooming with two other people and uh, you know, all the typical things that you do as a student and graduate, went to residency, start a residency. My first residency, I think I made 17, five for the year. And then my second year residency, I was living large. I was making 30 grand. And, uh, again, you're not paying your loans back at this point because you're just trying to make ends meet. Fast forward, end up moving to Florida, set up a practice, working, actually worked for somebody for a little bit. And began starting to pay my loans back and then started a little practice. And somewhere in there for maybe a year or so, I took a little um, a little forbearance just to kind of allow myself to get established and, and to, you know, because I didn't have any patience when I went solo because you could still do that back <laughs> when I began my practice. Anyway, long story short, you know, at some point, you know, my loan started being sold to different organizations and, uh, and I'd be paying back my loans, but it got really confusing at some point. And somewhere along the line, unfortunately, I went through a divorce and my ex-wife actually had consolidated her loans with mine. But the point is, when I started this all out, I took out about $130,000, which to me was not taking on debt. It was more of, I, I felt it was an investment in myself. And a good investment too, because I figured, well, you know, I'll be making more money than this, you know, as I, as I get out and get established and and, and so on. Well, by the time I was going through the divorce, now I'm owing well over probably $300,000 and there's no one in sight, but now the, the interest is accruing at a faster rate too. So how did I go from taking out about $130,000 to now owing, owing over 300 but I've been paying it off all along too. And this is where it got crazy. So as maybe the universe stepped in, um, you know, I'd been doing the uh, Inside the Doctor's Lounge show for MD coaches. And Joy was one of our guests. And we started talking and (laughs) it, it was just one of those moments where what she was saying hit home in a big way. And I will tell everybody, you know, you know, as physicians, we're not, listen, we maybe aren't always the sharpest tools in the shed, but we're also not dummies either. And we're pretty well financially, you know, astute 
we understand how things work. But there's a certain component of shame that went with this too that I was feeling because like how did, I felt like I got duped somehow. It's like how I, I I I told you this at one point. I felt like I could have done better if I borrowed money from Tony Soprano. Okay, because that's <laughs> that's kind of the gut punch when I saw how much I I owed, and so joy service was something I I said to her, listen, if you can help me out, I'll be forever in your debt. And not only did she help me out, she, she went above and beyond in my, in my estimation. Now she'll probably be humble and say that she didn't do anything exceptional other than what she would have done for anyone else. But she helped me organize this and see things in such a way that I realized that I had been paying back for over well over 20 years. It wasn't my imagination, but now, you know, up until about a, uh, up until a few months ago, now then interest. Now I'm over, over over four hundred thousand dollars and, and counting. So this insanity was just something that I finally resolved myself. So you know what? I'll probably never pay this off. Uh, I'll, I'll probably be dead, and then it'll be forgiven, and, and that'll be that. And, and so it's not that I was sitting around waiting for death, but it was certainly one of the options to be free from this this thing that I was carrying on my back for, for a long time. Again, you know, not living a crazy lifestyle by any means, just always being careful, making sure my bills are paid on time. But, you know, like a lot of people just not really, you know, you're still maybe a paycheck or two away from disaster, but also as a physician, you never know when your patients are coming in. You never know how you're going to project your income from, from year to year. And there were points even where I said, is this really all worth it? You know, it's like I'm doing what I love to do, but at the end of the day, is all the stress and aggravation and everything else, um, including the student loan indebtedness. You know, you're almost like trapped. It's like I, I, you, there's no way out. That's almost how you feel. Hi, I'm Rhonda Crow, founder and CEO for MD Coaches. Here on RX for Success, we interview a lot of great medical professionals on how they grew their careers how they overcame challenges, and how they handle day-to-day work. I really hope you're getting a lot of great information. But if you're looking for an answer to a specific problem, management or administration challenge, or if you're feeling just a, a bit burnt out, like maybe you chose the wrong career, well, then there's a faster way to get the help you need. No, it's not counseling, it's coaching. Rx for Success is produced by MD Coaches, a team of physicians who have been where you are. I know you're used to going it alone, but you don't have to. Get the support you need today. Visit us at mymdcoaches.com to schedule your complimentary consultation. Again, that's mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment. But right now, I want to tell you a little bit about Physician Outlook. If you haven't discovered this remarkable magazine, please do so very soon. It was created by physicians for physicians to showcase the intersection between clinical and non-clinical interests, whether it's writing, painting, cooking, politics, and dozens of other topics. Physician Outlook gives a physician perspective. It's available online and in print. It's really unique among physician lifestyle magazines. And like the Prescription for Success podcast, Physician Outlook amplifies the voice of any physician who has something to say. It also engages patients who still believe in physician-led, team-based care. And Prescription for Success listeners can get three months free when you enter our promo code rx for success and select the monthly option at checkout. That's a really great deal on this stunning publication. And now let's get back to today's interview. That's very helpful, Des. I just want to reflect the, especially that notion of here was my amount that I was indebted when I left medical school. And somehow that just kept increasing over the years, which is crazy. It's a very, very crazy um, just for us to think about. It, it is. Uh, and, you know, and I alluded to this kind of shame or embarrassment, but then I, after meeting Joy and just, you know, hearing what she was doing and then I realized it, and then starting talking about other people, other, you know, other physicians who've been well-established. Even I ran into an old classmate of mine at a uh, conference. I hadn't seen her in probably like close to 30 years now. 
her story was, was worse than mine. You know, she was practicing for years, ended up taking a job as a nurse in the prison system up in Pennsylvania to help pay off her debt. It's like, this is just crazy. You know, I was looking at other options too. I, I, I had started or founded a, a nonprofit organization I never took a salary from it, but because I wasn't taking a salary, even though I had been doing this for more than five years, like, did I qualify for forgiveness? So this is where Joy stepped in. She, she looked at, you know, my records. She told me what to do. She guided me every step along the way. And it wasn't a complicated process, but whatever she told me to do, I did maybe three or four different things along the way. That, that sounds like a cue for Joy. So Joy, I realize Des's situation is specific and you know, everybody has their own unique one, but can you enlighten us a little bit about how you, if you, what you from what you remember, how you approached helping Des work through this? Yeah, absolutely. And what we love about Dr. Des is he follows the the steps. Way to go, Dr. Des. Well, and, and the other thing I just want to just say, it takes a lot of gumption to talk about your student loans when they feel so big. So every time we enter into a discussion with a physician, we realize that. And so we enter very gently with a lot of understanding, no judgment. People's pathways are convoluted sometimes. And today is the day we have to talk about. And so we bring that to the conversation, which I think is so important when we're talking about finances. For us, the first thing is just to look at the facts. And so Dr. Dez sent us his official list of student loans, and then we just looked at it to see where he was, right? Um, based on all of the current opportunities available, the current repayment plans, the new account adjustment that we should talk about for other people like uh, your classmate, Dr. Des, there are people that have this exact same story that can really benefit right now. We have a, a deadline coming up at the end of the month, so we want to make sure to talk about this. Yes, yeah, so we look at the facts, look at the options, and then have a conversation about what are you currently doing? And we help the physicians understand if what they're doing is perfect, and then if so, we'll tell them. It takes about 15 minutes to get to that point. Not very long at all. And then from there, if there are things that we see that are missing, or in this case where there were, you know, a big opportunity to work through a number of things to get towards the end of the, the forgiveness in this case, often there are multiple steps that need to be taken. And so then we just lay out those steps. We crunch some numbers to show you know, the calculations to see what we might be looking at. And then we send step-by-step -step directions to the physician uh, about what to do. And that maybe takes 45 minutes, you know, the grand total, and the plan is set. And it's, like you said, it's not very complicated typically, but it's because we do this a lot with physicians and we understand what the different programs are. And uh, we know that doctors are busy folks and they just want to give me the data and what I should do and who to call if there's a problem. And so then we expect, Dr. Des was great at this, reaching back out when it had seemed like it was taking longer than it should, right, for the federal government to do their processing. That's all part of the unknown. But our role is to be supportive at that time and take the following step when it's needed. In your case, we needed to do a consolidation because you had some older loans and they didn't qualify for some of the new forgiveness. Uh, it's different for everybody, but yeah. we take care to make sure that people have the right information to make good decisions. Sure. Can you, can you, for our listeners, can you give an example of per, like perhaps the most common thing that they're not doing that, that you help them begin doing to be mm -hmm. able to reduce that debt in a more efficient way? Yeah, absolutely. So studentaid.gov, studentaid.gov is the federal government's website with all information about student loans. And there have been many changes and new opportunities. And always when there's a new opportunity at the top of that website, there will be an announcement describing this new opportunity. So if there's a listener on the call that's a do-it-yourselfer, that's the place to go to always stay up to date on the new information that's available. Um, for other people who want some support, Let's talk about the IDR account adjustment. This was the program that's really important for older physicians, maybe that have had student loans 
uh, back from the 90s. Most physicians back at that time, because interest rates were so low, are paying off their loans on a 30-year plan. Um, just made sense financially. Interest rates weren't as high as they are today. And most recently, the administration said that no one needs to pay for more than 25 years on their loans. So there may be physicians out there that didn't hear this. They're not paying attention to their loans anymore, right? They're just on whatever plan they're on. And uh, they don't know that with one easy step, usually they need to do a direct consolidation with the federal government to make those older loans qualify, like Dr. Dez needed to do. Then they qualify for something called the IDR account adjustment that's going to be happening by the federal government this summer. But the deadline to do that one step is the end of August. Um, so that's one example of something for an older, uh, more seasoned group of physicians to be paying attention to. For a younger group of physicians, uh, right now, there's a brand new repayment plan. It's called the SAVE plan, S-A-V-E. For many physicians, it can be a really smart way to pay off your student loans. What we love about it best is that if you pay your monthly payment based on your income, the additional interest will not accrue that month. So it's a way to keep those interest balances from ballooning like we used to see all the time. Um, so that's terrific. But for some physicians that have a higher income than their debt balance, being on the save might not be the best plan. There's another plan that has a cap on payments. So you see, Dale, we get into the details pretty quickly, but um, just an example of some of the things yeah. that physicians should be thinking of. We'll get back to our interview shortly, but first I want to take just a moment to speak to anyone who might be struggling with student loan debt. Did you know that around 75% of physician residents have student loans ranging from $250,000 to $500,000 or even more? And sometimes interest rates can be triple that of a home mortgage. Regardless of the balance on your student loan, you can benefit from a counselor with no vested interest in your decisions. Joy Sorensen Navarre, founder and president of Navigate, is a neutral third party working for a flat fee to create huge savings for physicians. She's a frequent speaker at residency programs, hospitals, and conferences, and she's been published in journals and websites throughout the medical community. So regardless of the balance on your student loan, do yourself a favor and contact Joy Sorensen Navarre at NavigateStudentLoans.com. Are you a doctor struggling to provide the best care for your patients while dealing with financial and caregiving matters out of the scope of your practice? Do you find yourself scrambling to keep up with the latest resources and wish there was an easier way? Then this virtual caregiver conference resource will save you time, money, and sanity by giving you all the resources and information your patients need in one place. This conference helps you and your patients enlist the best strategies around healthcare resources and the best financial steps for your patients while navigating caregiving situations. You don't have to go home feeling frustrated and helpless because you couldn't connect your patients with the best services. Find out more at JeannieDoherty.com or click in the link in the show's notes. You don't want to miss this caregiver resource. Yeah. Yeah, those are, those are great. And you, you said that IDR account adjustment, that deadline is August or is it April? Excuse me, April 30th. Yeah, I wondered, I went, I, I thought I'd heard you say that before we started recording. Yeah. Yeah, so important for, and and what do people, besides contacting you, um, who what, what else would they need to do to learn about that? Yeah, um, all the information they need would be at studentaid.gov. And then they can use the search bar to find out um, IDR account adjustment. And please uh, reach out to us. We can easily help you with that. And uh, it would be an honor to do so. Yeah, nice. Great. Des, I want to turn back to you. Um, and you've already kind of indicated how helpful Joy was in and, you know, she mentioned some of the details about how that was helpful. But I guess what I want to hear is the impact that that had on you? I will just tell you, you know, when I first started working with Joy, I felt a calmness, you know, in regards to this that I haven't felt for years because, you know, that, that interest just creeps up. It's so insidious. You don't even realize it until one day it's like, how the hell did this happen? You know, and, 
So anyway, when she, you know, put together a program for me or a little plan, I looked at it. It's like, okay, this is doable and we'll, we'll get there. That was the first phase, but then came the good news. She reached out to me at one point and said, listen, I think that you're going to qualify for total forgiveness because you've been paying back on your loans for, I think it was like 23 or 25 years at the time. I was like, okay, this is too good to be true, but you know, I'm not going to be celebrating just yet. We're not popping the champagne cork <laughs> or the champagne bottle yet. And then as time went by, you know, it was like, no, this is looking like it's going to happen. When I tell you that when I got an email from Mohila, which was, you know, they basically, they're, they're the conduit now where they're providing all the information to me about my loan after the consolidation, telling me that my loans were forgiven. I couldn't, I, it's like, I, I just, I still didn't believe it. Like, I just, I think the first thing I did was I took screenshots and I sent it to Joy. I said, okay, is this legit? And, and so, you know, having that forgiven, there's, there's a political climate right now in this country, as we all know, you can't escape it. And, and whatever side you're on, you know, there, there's information, people are going to give you the, the information that they want you to hear. But I think part of the reason I'm throwing my story out here too, is I want people to understand that you know, having the loans forgiven, no forgiveness is one thing, but I paid those loans back in reality, probably twice. And yet I was still left holding the bag for over $400,000. Like, how does this happen? This should never happen. This, there's something wrong here and this needs to be fixed. And so Joy's service, basically, not only did she take the weight of the world off my shoulders, but, you know, I was really looking at, it's like, you know, if I finally do retire, um, at some point, am I even going to be able to enjoy anything? Am I going to even be able to do other things? Or am I going to be strapped with this always hanging over my head? And, you know, I want to leave money to, to family, whatever it is, you know, all the little goals that we have, you know, they're in their humble goals. They're, they're, it's not something crazy, but it just impacts your whole, your thought process and your mindset. Fortunately, I think I'm strong enough to, to navigate through this type of thing and, and you know, I just live in the moment, but at the same time, it's like, the, you know, the future is really unclear with all this hanging over my head. So to have this, when I tell you what a gift, and as you know, Dale, as physicians, we, we dedicate our lives to giving to others all the time and we don't expect anything, but what joy did for me, it's like, pff, can never repay her. Thank you, Des. I know it's a, it, the, there's the vulnerability of, and shame, but there's also the vulnerability of, of the joy. <laughs> oh my God. Well. Yeah. Listen, you know, I, I still remember watching the ball go through Buckner's legs in the world series and watching friends of mine celebrating because they were Red Sox fans. So I learned a lesson that night many years ago. You don't celebrate until it's a done deal. And yeah, you know, once I got, you know, verification, I was like, wow. So we we did pop the champagne, believe me. Yeah. That is a huge, <laughs> huge weight. We should not underestimate how big that is. And I'm still astounded by this accumulation of debt because of the the interest rates. And by the way, that it also made me you said something earlier, Des, that made me want to ask Joy something. It was about this, you know, loans get sold to other companies. And yeah. I was just curious to Joy, does that have something to do with how these things get compounded or, you know, what is that about that? I know that I should an annoy the heck out of me when our mortgage got sold to another company. The selling or the transferring of loans from company to company really isn't the biggest problem related to the interest rates. Um, it is the actions that almost all the loan servicing companies do between the lines of what's legal, what's accepted. You know, there are a lot of gray areas out there um, for management of student loans. And these companies, I believe, in a predatory manner are taking advantage of borrowers in a way that increases their profitability, in a way that then increases the interest rates. And so, you know, there could be a number of months in the processing of some kind of a um, application for a certain repayment plan. It should happen immediately. Instead, it takes three months. You don't make payments during those three months, but interest accumulates during those three months, right? So it's those kind of tricky things that seem innocuous in like, like between one person and one month, but when you put it together over a lifetime of payments and then over a whole nation of borrowers, 
Um, it's a big problem. Oh, yeah. That's really huge. Yeah. So, Joy, let me just, um, as we kind of wind up here, anything else that you, anything else about Des's story first that you want to add to or um, enhance um, in terms of how it was, how working with him was unique or not so unique? It's a pleasure to work with you, Des. I know what you do on the side to help uh, people with their their wounds and just this amazing work. And I remember back on that original podcast, you said a couple of things. And I thought to myself, first, I was so impressed that you were being vulnerable, like on the air with people about having your own student loans, right? And then, um, but I also didn't want to impose. And so I, you know, didn't push for services or anything. But then you connected or somehow we connected together along the way. And it felt like seriously an honor to be working with you because of how I esteem you and the work that you're doing for the community. And the fact that I could somehow in a little way help you, you know, help others, that to me, you know, I would love to do that all day long. Sure, thank you. You know, turn that around to the honor and pleasure have been mine. And I vowed that I would do anything I could do to help you because what your service is doing, you're helping people that are vulnerable and can really use the help. And, you know, we get so wrapped up in, you know, our world and focused and, and then life steps in and, you know, before you know it. So I felt that if my story, it, it may resonate with others and I have a feeling it will. And, and so, you know, the way you get this stuff out, we have to get it out in the open first, and then we can start to solve and, and work together. And, you know, we have a responsibility to help each other out that we're all passing through, right? So that's that's our role. We should be there for each other. And that's why, okay, if it happened to me, not that I'm so genius, but I'm sure it's happening to other people. And, you know, they shouldn't have to deal with the same kind of stress. You know, life's too short. This is just bad stuff and it needs to be, it needs to be fixed. Like I said, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that agree with you, Des. <laughs> Let me just uh, ask each of you if there's anything else that you'd like to impart to listeners that hasn't been said yet. So I'll start with you, Des, and then we'll give Joy the, the final word. Anything else you'd like for people to know? Listen, to be in medical practice, you have to be financially viable to be able to provide your service. And you, and that even goes to the, to the extent of paying your bills, being able to go to work every day without, without worrying about stress, you have to be focused. So you don't need this kind of stuff hanging over your head. So to have a service like what Joy's provided it is just incredible. But early on in, in your student loan journey, let's say, or however you do it, take out as little as you can. I would highly recommend that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. But, you know, we all have to do what we have to do. And understand that there are resources out there. It's just, um, it's part of the life lessons. And, you know, you're trying to do the right thing. I, I, there were times where I'd say, man, I could have bought a house for this and I'd be doing really well. But, you know, it's all worked out now the way it's supposed to. And just uh, know that there are people, again, there are resources out there. The other little tip I would say, if you're still in your 20s, start, start that IRA start learn the 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 advantages of compounding interest not the disadvantages of it when you're on the on the borrowing side so and if you got little kids start those uh programs for them now great great, great sage advice does joy how about you final thoughts things that you'd like to impart that we haven't heard yet i would say that there's always hope you know student loans are a heavy burden and yet we have yet to find someone that there wasn't a good option for, right? There's always options available. Uh, don't go it alone, reach out, uh, we're happy to help, but there's other organizations just like us. So um, if you hire someone to do your taxes, you hire someone to mow your lawn, uh, think about finding someone to support you on your student loan plans. Uh, so it's complex enough that you probably don't wanna do it on your own and there is good support out there. Well, those are very kind and uh, reassuring words, I think, for a lot of people who are listening. So once again, Joy Sorensen Navar and Dr. Desbell, thank you so much for being guests on Life Changing Moments. I think this will enable a lot of folks to um, 
meet the, some of those branch points that they have for their financial health um, as a result of your willingness to be here today. So thank you once again. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for tuning in to Life Changing Moments. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate us five stars and leave a review. Doing so helps our podcast reach more listeners. Have something to share? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Visit the MD Coaches community on Facebook groups. This dynamic virtual space is a place to continue discussion about life-changing moments and perhaps share some life-changing moments of your own. Join the conversation today.